Good afternoon. So we're resuming with the session this afternoon after a coffee break uh, with a focus on the uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, the topic of the, uh, the title of the panel that uh, we'll be talking again is uh, uh, the uh, room for manure in the Eastern Partnership and incorpor incorporating different degrees of integration uh, with the EU. We will have uh, the panel which will consist of uh, four speakers, two of them uh, will be online. Uh, we will have uh, uh, Ivana klimpusch tsintsadze uh, She will join us online from Kyiv. Uh, as you well know, she is the head of the European Integration uh, Committee uh, at the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine. Uh, we see her. Hello, Ivana. Uh, we will also have uh, Igor Zhovka, or Zhovkva, who will join us a bit later. Um, uh, from uh, Kiev as well, Deputy Head of the Office of the President of Ukraine. Uh, and we have two uh, speakers here uh, in the House, uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia, uh, Temur Janjalia, and uh, um, Julian Groza, Director of the European Policy and Reform Institute from Moldova. So without uh, further ado, let's just jump straight into the uh, topic. Uh, I will start from uh, Ivana. Um, I think she can hear us. Uh, and the first question I want to ask the participants here is about their uh, expectations with regard to the next steps with the European Union. The heroic struggle of the Ukrainian people for their independence and, and, and for their freedom not only destroyed the myths of uh, Russian might and the strength of the second, uh, so-called second army in the world, uh, but it also created new opportunities in terms of European integration uh, for the Eastern Partnership states. And we saw the decisions of this year uh, by the European Council, which effectively provided all three states of the Eastern Partnership uh, European perspective, but gave the candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova. So my question is, what do you see are the next steps for Ukraine in, in this uh, strive towards the European integration? Floor is yours, Ivana. Uh, hello, um, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this invitation and thank you for um, having this opportunity to, to talk um, at the, this very important forum and to render uh, some of the thoughts we have here in Ukraine with regard to the future uh, developments. But let me, uh, before answering your question, very briefly actually resolve to, some, to something that struck me uh, with this panel, because uh, this panel is about Eastern Partnership, and the whole conference is about real politic versus ideal politic. And I was thinking that, uh, you know, I... I don't in particular like uh, real politic because uh, many people who wanted to use it, uh, they are predominantly um, kind of focusing on even um, argumenting and agreeing and, and ready to justify the right of the might and uh, who are ready to discuss the spheres of influence of the bigger states. And with regard to ideal politic, that's probably not even the goal, but that's something that is... Um, a reality that is not possible today. And probably this ideal politic is, uh, is definitely different for um, everybody who is, he's, who is working on this or other issue. And um, so when I saw this, this topic of um, Eastern partnership, I thought that um, it's, a, it's kind of a strange and, and bigger problem that we are discussing something that is uh, neither real politic uh, nor the ideal politic, because it's um, we, we we I thought that we are we are going to discuss something that is not uh, existence in, uh, existent anymore, and uh, um, that is continuously being still discussed, even the suspension of the Belarusian uh, participation um, in the EAP, uh, even after the 24th of February, and after the next steps uh, or next round of, um, of conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and uh, after Ukraine and uh, Moldova receiving the candidate status and Georgia receiving the European perspective. So I... I understand that's probably part of the kind of bureaucracy that is difficult to stop something that exists already as an instrument. But I think we have to, to be very honest and very sincere with ourselves. And if something is dead, we have to declare something dead. 
Um, and I think that we have to, to agree among ourselves, among the friends, that Eastern partnership is not existent anymore. As uh, American Indians are saying, if the horse is dead, dismount. So it's exactly what we have to do. And we have to think how actually, um, and, and how we have to focus on the, on, on the future through probably totally other instruments and through totally other uh, possibilities. And if, if we are talking today uh, about the future of relationship between the uh, European Union and Ukraine, definitely we, um, I should start from uh, gratitude to all the European nations for taking this very, very important for Ukrainian people, for Ukrainian society decision of providing us with the candidate status along with Moldova. And I'm very saddened by the fact that our Georgian friends um, have not uh, received it simultaneously with um, our two countries. But I think we also have to be sincere um, in understanding and in, in agreeing why this is happening. Uh, this has happened this way and how and maybe think through some of the instruments to help Georgia to reach this point uh, together with us. One follow up before I move on to the other uh, friends here. Uh, so uh, Ukraine expects to start the uh, negotiations, basic succession negotiations, uh, as some of your high level officials have declared sometime next year. How realistic it is from your perspective? Because you just got the candidate status this year uh, and uh, betting on starting the negotiations next year. So. Uh, real politic-wise, how realistic do you think uh, that could happen? Uh, yes, there is a big desire here in Ukraine to move very promptly um, from the step of receiving the candidate status to uh, start of the negotiations on the accession. And I think you are very right here that we have to use the realistic approach and have to understand how that it's a, dependent on Ukrainian uh, speed and deliverables on all those seven conditions that Ukraine has received together with the, uh, with the candidate status, but also it depends on the ability and uh, um, uh, readiness of the EU institutions to deliver their feedback on urgent matters where we need some of the assessments, some of the expertise from the European Union. And that is not there yet. And that is um, not going with such a optimistic speed as Ukrainian government has seen up till now. So um, I always did belong to those people who were trying to um, assess and take into consideration all the aspects of this other move. So I do not really expect that... Um, uh, we can break through with start of the accession negotiations in 2023. But I want to be mistaken. And I want to um, um, assure you that here in the Ukrainian parliament, and uh, I hope also in the Ukrainian government, we are ready to, to work on our part of the homework, irrespectively or on the top of uh, having to fight this bloody war at this particular moment. Uh, so our expectation is that in the meantime, the EU will build actually the capacity and will uh, straighten up its internal procedures to the extent that it will have um, the vis-a-vis -vis for, um, for Ukrainian counterparts to respond prom promptly, efficiently and um, adequately to any of the uh, requests uh, for assessments, uh, for screening, for uh, monitoring with the speed and uh, resolve um, that is also present on the Ukrainian side. Thank you. Um, uh, coming back to this issue which uh, uh, Ivanka may, uh, uh, raised here, which Ivana raised here about the Eastern Partnership basically being dead and there's a, being a new process, um, which is the candidate status for Ukraine and Moldova and uh, European perspective for Georgia, but basically putting them in the same kind of enlargement basket, just a bit uh, a step uh, away from each other. Um, uh, Julian, to follow up on that, do you think that a trio is also dead? I understand that uh, the um, trio was created as a political 
region, basically. Geographically, it's not really a region. We know that all the European enlargements have happened on a geographic logic, geographic basis, and TUI was created, manufactured, basically, by the politicians and the diplomats of the three states with that purpose. And now, with Ukraine and Moldova being a step ahead, and with seeing that there might not be that much appetite in Kiev to, to associate, or the, some problems with Georgia, I'll come back to this question later uh, to, to Temur, do you think TRIO as a, as a political region uh, is still a viable entity and, or, or do you think that now it's Ukraine and Moldova are already in a different speed of integration with the EU? Sergey, um, Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia have a lot of things in common. And we had various formats where we have been looking at uh, enhancing our political, economic, uh, sectorial cooperation. Uh, Eastern Partnership Policy Framework has provided uh, a new impetus, a new um, uh, objective, association with European Union, association agreements, uh, economic integration. This is what made us to be trio. Uh, last year, there were a lot of attempts to set up this type of more enhanced uh, political kind of cooperation uh, in the format of trio in Batumi, uh, in Brussels, ahead of the Eastern Partnership Summit in December. There were a lot of uh, initiatives uh, trying to shape this new approach, trying to zoom in a bit the policy, uh, which happened in a way. Uh, we have Guam as well, uh, which continues in a way or another way, where we have also Azerbaijan involved. Uh, so I think today with uh, the, the new European political community, there are even more uh, kind of platforms, political, intergovernmental interactions in, in, in uh, where our countries can interact. Uh, but the short answer to your question is uh, the trio is here, basically, at this panel, too. Yeah, we have, as mentioned, a, a lot of things in common. And most importantly, we have uh, uh, something in common in terms of the future. Uh, all of our countries uh, are countries uh, uh, with clear European perspectives recognized. Ukraine, Moldova, indeed, uh, uh, is a bit, a bit further in terms of getting the candidate status. I'm sure Georgia, uh, when ready, uh, will, uh, will, will, uh, will get uh, the candidate status as well. Uh, but what is important is that the speed uh, towards EU may differ, but the direction is clear. Uh, and we also have to face uh, the reality. Uh, the Eastern Partnership, as it was established, I think it has uh, managed to reach its main objectives. Uh, and as it looks today in the region, the challenges we face uh, and the new realities in terms of our interaction also with the EU and the new uh, approach of the, Eastern, of the European Union towards uh, our countries indicates to the fact that Eastern Partnership is obsolete even though it was updated recently, in December last year. But many things have happened in between. Um, and uh, this means that I think um, what should matter, uh, should, uh, uh, in, in terms of our uh, future developments, is our future, which is European future. Uh, without any doubts, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia will be part of the European Union. Uh, we need to do our homework. Uh, we need to increase our resilience. Ukraine is fighting. Ukraine is fighting. Ukrainian people are fighting for their integrity, for their sovereignty against the Russian aggression, the brutal aggression. And U Ukraine is defending uh, Europe. Ukraine is defending us. Moldova is the most vulnerable uh, country in the region. Even though Moldova is not today uh, conventionally under Russian aggression, Moldova has been under hybrid aggression of Russia for years. Uh, and Moldova understands what Russia aggression means. 12% of our territory is still occupied by Russian illegal troops in the Eastern region, which today poses additional security concerns and security, imminent security risks to my country. Today, Moldova is not alone. Moldova is supported by Western partners, by the EU. Moldova is a country to become a member of the European Union. We have a lot of things to, to do internally. We face a lot of challenges, crises. Um, a part of the, of the war, which is at our border, uh, the economic crisis, um, the 
energy crisis, which unfortunately is used uh, by Russia in blackmailing uh, Moldova as we are entering into winter and as we speak today. So a part of that, uh, what it is important is that we increase our resilience, domestic resilience, uh, keep our track on, uh, on reforms, democratic tra tra transformation, rule of law. Moldova has been vulnerable for years due to kleptocratic influence, which was using the, the, the state institutions uh, for their purpose. You know, and now the real, the real challenge for us is to uh, clean uh, the justice system from corruption and from corrupt. I'll come back to this. That's another thing I want to discuss. But I would move now to, uh, to Igor, who is joining us uh, uh, from, from Kiev. Um, so we're talking here about the Eastern Partnership and potential different speeds of integration with the EU. But obviously, Ukraine right now has a serious challenge or a serious security issue at hand. It's fighting war for survival uh, um, with Russia. And we all follow the news on a daily basis, uh, seeing what Russia has been doing in the last, not just months, but now in the last days, bombing civilian infrastructure. Um, so maybe we can move to that uh, aspect of, of, of Ukrainian daily life, basically. So what is it that Ukraine needs right now from the European Union, from the West, to you know, to, to, to defeat this imminent challenge that Russia is uh, providing to Ukraine, the attacks on the civilian infrastructure, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, attacking the energy objects and, and, and uh, you know, trying to basically um, turn the lights uh, uh, off uh, in Ukraine. Igor? Thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It really is important uh, to have such a conference, such a hectic time. Sorry for being a little bit late. Just was meeting with my president, with the EBRD president who came to Kiev today, despite the bombings, right? You are, despite the shellings. You know, we usually start the mornings. We even don't break our nights uh, uh, with air raid sirens. So today, we were lucky to have a short, rather short air raid siren, like for half an hour. It's, 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 it's a miracle, you know, throughout the last uh, two weeks or even throughout, uh, throughout almost eight months of the war, uh, 240th day to day. You know, we have a, a little bit different calendar probably than you are now. You, in your normal life, it's 21st of October, first day of Riga conference, and for us it's 240th day on the war. I will come back to this, but Rene, I, I joined your discussion uh, when uh, when you asked uh, uh, Julian about whether Trio is alive or not. Uh, let me react on this because this is also a, a, a subject, a topic which is connected to fighting Russian aggression together. I remember exactly a year ago, 22nd of October, I was sitting in peaceful Kyiv uh, with uh, foreign policy advisors, my fellow colleagues uh, from, from, from Moldova, uh, my friend Kristina Gerasimov, uh, there were representatives from Georgia and myself uh, from Ukraine, were sitting in, in, in Kyiv uh, discussing actually the perspectives for TRIO. Yes, right, yeah, there was a few or even less than a month after the Batumi summit, which we prepared also uh, thoroughly. I still remember how we drafted this Batumi declaration. It, it was really uh, quite good, still good. But then war happened. The open war against Ukraine, which started on the 24th of February, uh, because the war actually started in 2014, as you well remember. And you know, many were asking also, probably not the question, where is the trio? But the question about where are our partners and friends in the first days of war? Because many of our partners reacted whimsically, you know. Uh, you, you, you probably heard this narrative about three or five days uh, throughout which Kyiv had to be captured together with, if not all, but the most part of Ukraine. And what we needed more in those first days, then it became first weeks, then it became first months, and now tomorrow there will be eight months of the war. We had three main, and still having, three main demands to our partners. Weapon, sanctions, financial support. In five days, we added another pillar. After 28th of February, when on the fifth day of war, my president summoned an application for membership. 
was pillar number four or general pillar. It's about support of Ukraine in its bid for European Union. So you're asking me very trio, and I would ask you, where was Georgia and Moldova in the first days of war? Weapons, sanctions, financial support. I will probably stop on this, though I can elaborate. So we would really appreciate if your countries, like you're rightfully saying, striving uh, for the European Union as well as Ukraine is striving, would take the behavior pattern of each and every European Union member. Not all of them are supporting us with those three pillars because obviously the countries are different in their size, in their financial capacities, but all each and every of them support us in at least one of these pillars. I like this example of, sorry for my Estonian colleagues, but a small country of Estonia who gave almost half of its military budget to support Ukraine in terms of weaponry. I hear from my Czech colleagues, you know, you almost emptied our military warehouses we, we, we gave you all we had, starting from ammunition to, 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 to other equipment. But we do know that unfortunately it's, it will last for a, such, for a certain period of time. So let's start already now to produce more ammunition, more artillery, more heavy weaponry to support you. Because right here, we are not only fighting for ourselves. We are fighting for all of you, for Georgia, for Moldova, for France, for Germany, for the rest 25 only European Union members. But we're also fighting for non-European Union members who are situated on the European continent. And that's where we get the support from all of them. Either equipment, I mean, military equipment, or sanctions, unanimous support, despite the difficulties, despite the tough discussions, eight packages of sanctions adopted by the European Union. Yesterday, my president was speaking at this regular European Union summit. You know, it became a good habit. The president is speaking on each and every European summit, president of Ukraine. And he already talked about ninth package of sanctions. He thanked, president of the EU, as well as each and every leader present in the whole room for the Iranian sanctions and the Iran sanctions, which were introduced yesterday by the European Union immediately as a reaction on Iran selling the drones, which are killing Ukrainians more and more because this is not a new tactics, but a rather new weapon. They started to use drones, which are primitive, which are Mesozoic era drones, but they carry bombs which kill my people each and every day in almost all cities of Ukraine. So my president thanked for Iranian sanctions, but said this is too far too little and asked for more anti-Iran sanctions from the European Union. And from what I heard, the European Union countries are starting also the activities in this regard. So this is the support. If you can tell me about sanctions introduced by Georgia against Russia, or sanctions to Moldova against Russia, or maybe you're also following the tendency in the EU, we asked them to deprive Russians from entry visas to each and every capital, to each and every country of the European Union. Yes, they've done something. They, abolish this visa facilitation agreement for Russians. It's now much more difficult for Russians to, or, or almost next to impossible for tourists, tourists, so-called tourists, who entered some sites in Czech Republic, you might remember, in United Kingdom, still it is not a member of the EU, but it's on the European continent, and made the blast or, or used this uh, poisoning. Uh, 
but they are working in that direction. And when I'm asking my Georgian colleagues about, would you follow this tendency of limiting, let's call it like this, number of Russians entering Georgia now? Because yes, Georgia now is one of the places where Russians are hiding or hiding, I don't know, their assets. Them, I don't know. Yeah, um, but so unfortunately, I feel no answer. Sorry, let me finish. Let yeah, me sure. finish. Sure, go ahead. Go when, ahead. You, when you asking me about what is going on in the Ukraine, every everyone in the world is is watching what is going on in Ukraine. I mean, I'm appearing like five or six times in different channels every day and every night. Uh, so I can tell you. I can tell you that we are freezing now. 30% of Ukrainian energy, electricity grids and systems are ruined, but we're managing to repair them very, 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 very quickly. And European Union supporting us, they already gave us diesel generators and other items, uh, but we need more. And that's what we talk with president of the EU, Commissioner Narcic was here, we talked with him, just talked with president of the EBRD. Uh, so that's what we need. And there are another potential areas when Russia can also do disasters. Uh, you, 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 you know about their black mainland about nuclear power. I mean, they can now, and my president was speaking yesterday on the European uh, Union summit about this. They are now planning to blow up the uh, hydropower plant in Kahovka, which may have a dire consequences, not only for the southern region of Ukraine, but may hit the uh, nuclear power plants, which are situated on the south of uh, my country. And this is also maybe a nuclear disaster. So that's where we live. I will finish this by saying we need each and every support from each and every state. Even smallest support counts, feels, is seen by Ukrainians, will be greeted by my president, but only united we can win. If you think that uh, if we wouldn't stop the aggression in Ukraine, aggressor will stop in Ukraine. You definitely in your countries know that this is not happening. This will not happen. Our neighbors in Poland, in Baltic states, in Slovakia, Romania, and the other countries do know this. So my appeal to you and my answer to your question about trio, I don't know what the trio is like, but I know that Ukraine will win. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Uh... Well, obviously, when we talk about the Eastern Partnership, uh, there's a big elephant in the room which you cannot avoid, and that is the extremely cold relations between Georgia and Ukraine at this stage. And Igor referred to some of the uh, concerns that he has, and it has been repeated on a number of occasions by many, including in Georgia, as well as uh, we've heard those things from Kiev. So I'm going to go to uh, Temur now with basically the, 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 the request for an explanation. So. There is a concern that Georgia did not join sanctions. There is a concern that um, Georgian uh, rhetoric towards Ukraine is far from friendly. We've seen a number of quite hostile statements from politicians of, of every country. Yesterday, we saw the decision by President Zelensky to sanction some of the people who are in a close circle of Mr. Ivanishvili, the, the Georgian oligarch who is the founder of the ruling party. So basically the question is, what is happening there? Is there a perspective of making these relations right uh, from the side of the you know, Georgian government representative? Because obviously, as long as, those, as long as these concerns, legitimate concerns prevail, talking about trio will just be, a, 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 will just be talking. Because clearly, Ukraine is disappointed. Uh, you know, we saw the discussion in the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe several days ago, where Russia was declared a terrorist state and the Georgian representatives did not vote for the resolution. So what is going on? Can you please provide an explanation on that? Thank you, Sergei. Thank you. And first of all, as we are relating to the Eastern Partnership and the future of the Eastern Partnership, I would like to react on this at, at the initial stage. So first uh, and the most important thing is that uh, Eastern Partnership uh, already did prove that uh, it has managed uh, many things and the trio success which we had uh, is on place. So the trio uh, countries already have a European perspective and uh, we got the message that uh, we are going to be the members of the European Union. 
So we as well, Georgia, uh, got the, our own job to be done at home and we are doing this job and we did hope that uh, end of the next year, so we will join our friends from Ukraine and Moldova and we will get the candidacy status as well from the European Union and we will continue our devoted reform process, which we have and never stopped it. Uh, when we are talking about the Easter partnership, we should not forget that we only not trio it in this Easter partnership and we have other partners within the uh, format. So, and uh, we always were advocating that the Easter partnership, it's of course a mutual endeavor, but as well as there should be some uh, uh, tailored based approach. And we're always advocating that uh, the countries which are specially located in our region so we have to see how we can use, how Europe can be useful for them and this country can be useful for Europe. And we have seen it recently that uh, president of the uh, commission arrived in our neighboring country and uh, really important uh, decisions have been taken regarding the energy security and transportation security of the European continent. So it means that uh, uh, these countries still matter and is their partnership still matter. I think that uh, what we have now, the new developments as well regarding the economic and investment plan within the, this format, it's one of the main uh, uh, generators of cooperation within the Easter partnership because we see that we countries uh, have our own uh, priorities, so-called flagship initiatives, and this flagship initiative, so we have the main directions, which are uh, energy, which are transportation, which are the connectivity, uh, direct contacts between the uh, Georgia and European markets. And I'm talking about the direct ferry connection between the Georgian uh, ports and the Romanian port, which brings Europe much more closer to Georgia and much more closer to the countries uh, which are located in our region. So because of this, so we are considering that uh, we see some prospects in the future as well to be developed within the initiative. And of course, as I mentioned already, we have to have this tailored base approach and project-oriented approach within the uh, Easter partnership format. Now regarding the uh, war in Ukraine, and of course I have to once again express my people's, my government's uh, support toward Ukrainian independence, sovereignty, and support to the brave people, brave Ukrainian people. And it was several times mentioned already that the Ukrainians are standing and defending not only themselves, but defending all Europe, defending maybe the whole world that, uh, if not Ukraine, that could be some developments, what we have seen as well and discussed in the previous panels as well. But we have to pay attention uh, as well when we are talking about Georgia and when we are talking about the aggression. So we have to remember always that the Georgia was the first country when full-fledged military aggression we got from the Russian Federation in 2008. Before the 2008, we got two wars in Georgia. Before 2008, we got a full economic embargo on Georgia. Before 2008, we got the full energy cut when we 100% were depending on uh, Russian Federation gas supplies to Georgia markets. And unfortunately, again, and we are repeating, and not only we, but the international community now, and we are happy really, and uh, it's really strong understanding that it was a mistake when from 2008 till 2014, there was no reaction, proper reaction, maybe some single countries, single governments reacted on this, but international communities, the democratic Western world didn't react it properly on this. In opposite, we have some opposite movements toward Russia and saying that uh, maybe more prospects Russia have just to interact. And we have seen already this in 2014 in Ukraine. Even Ukraine did not teach us a lesson, teach us, I'm meaning, about the international democratic community. Even 2014 was not the lesson which we should learn. And unfortunately, what is happening and what is happening now uh, in our region, in, in, in uh, our countries, is a result of this. And uh, I have to underline that the war in Georgia didn't finish. We have still in war. 
We have still occupation forces in both regions, both occupied regions of Georgia. We have still occupied forces so from five to 6,000 permanently based Russian soldiers and permanently based rockets, which can reach not only Tbilisi, but some and other capitals in our region. So we have a huge challenge as well in front of us and we are fighting for. And we, are, we should to survive and we should to survive together. And as I mentioned at my initial uh, beginning of my speech that Ukraine should be victorious and we should be victorious just to make this world more safe and more developed. Uh, just uh, a brief follow up there, but still the question is, can, the Georgia, can Georgia as a country or as a government of Georgia do more to alleviate the concerns that Ukrainian partners have? Because obviously what you said, it all makes sense, but it really does not remove the concerns. Because the concerns that uh, Igor and the other Ukrainian friends air is that there are things you could do and you're not doing that. So the question is why and can that be changed? Yeah, things what Igor mentioned, it's a uh, ammunition military, things are the sanctions and things are support. Regarding the ammunition, we, you know, everybody knows what the situation is in Georgia regarding the military equipment and uh, what was the reaction of the international community after the war of 2008 for Georgia. So we were deprived just to even to get some defense equipment, military equipment till, if I rightly remember, till 2015 after the Crimean annexation uh, occupation so uh, somehow these things change it. So we ourselves will in quite a need just to have such an equipment and to uh, provide for our military forces. And unfortunately, we don't have any opportunity just to have something to, to uh, resent somewhere. Regarding the sanctions, we several times already announced that the sanctions which are in place now. So uh, again and again, so we have to consider the situation and uh, what is happening now in Georgia, what is happening now at occupied territories, what signals we got after war started in Ukraine, what signals we got in Abkhazia, what signals we got in South Asia region. And of course, when we are talking about the concrete actions from the Georgian government, you have seen clearly that at the initial stage in the previous, in the first days of, of the war, we already implemented the financial ones which are in line of the international sanctions and it was recognized by our European and US friends when State D Department in August, if I'm not mistaken, of this year declared that the Georgia in line with all the financial sanctions which internationally, international community um, led, uh, towards Ukraine. So it was uh, the uh, concrete actions regarding the commercial uh, goods tra transiting or importing uh, to Georgia, even these days, so there is a string control at the borders. Would it be the Georgia-Russian border, Georgia-Armenia, Georgia-Turkey, or Georgian-Azerbaijanian border? There is a strong control. And you know that we have a statistics that the many uh, trailers, many ships from the Georgian ports have been returned uh, in their places of origin because we consider it that it could be some either sanctioned goods or there could be against of sanctions which are implemented by the international community. It does not mean that we, if we are not officially joining the sanctions, that we are not acting like uh, our partners in Europe and like our partners uh, in, 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 in other continents. So, and of course, when we are talking about this, please consider as well what opportunities, what power we have just to do and how we are doing everything for to support our Ukrainian friends. I'm not talking about the humanitarian su support because we are one of the biggest uh, supporters uh, in case of the humanitarian uh, to Ukraine and many other things. But what we can do at this moment, we are doing our maximum and we will continue, we will continue in this manner, we will continue to be, uh, to be uh, with our Ukrainian friends in this uh, terrible war. Thank you, Tim. Uh I'm going to go to uh, Julian now, and maybe if there are questions in the audience, uh, you, can, uh, you can kind of prepare. But the question I have to, to you is that, so Moldova also did not join sanctions. Nonetheless, uh, the criticism towards Moldova is a lot less than it is towards Georgia from the side of Kyiv. 
We all know the high degree of dependence of Moldova on, on, on Russia in terms of gas. Uh, we all know how precarious politically the situation is inside, but nonetheless, you still manage to get the candidate status. So how did that happen? In other words, what is the secret where you did not join sanctions, nonetheless, you're still together in the same pool with Ukraine, you still have this kind of a pressure point from Russia, but nonetheless, you still kind of manage to go through. Yes, there's, a, there's winter ahead, but uh, so are you concerned? So how, how do you manage to maneuver through this extremely kind of challenging uh, uh, problems, I might dare say, unlike uh, uh, Georgia. Well, first of all, uh, um, Igor mentioned about the panel in Kiev. I was honored to moderate that panel in, in Kiev uh, uh, together with uh, Igor and Kristina. And indeed, we were talking about uh, TRIO. And at that time, I also had the feeling that uh, uh, there was no TRIO in the air. Uh, and, uh, um, but to, to, to answer to your question, Sergei, and to Igor at the same time, I can, I can answer as an active member of Moldovan think tank community and civil society uh, and, and, and say the following um, about defense support, uh, uh, about defense support from Moldova. Uh, Moldova is the country that needs more defense support than other countries in the region, for sure. And that's one of the mistakes of our political elites for years. Since the war in 1992 uh, with Russia, uh, the political elites decided to take uh, the policy of neutrality as the one to protect our security. Uh, but uh, not considering the fact that neutrality means also uh, enforcing but the politicians, unfortunately, have not invested in defense and security in the country uh, to the point that 0.05% of our GDP represents investments to defense. Um, but that is not, uh, probably it's not an excuse to say that Moldova cannot provide, uh, I don't know, whatever uh, military support because we don't uh, really have it. And I remember the exchanges about the planes, uh, which are not flying, and uh, there was a lot of fuss about that discussion and so on and so forth. I mean, this mix uh, we had as well. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, but uh, Moldova is, uh, of course, maybe with uh, less uh, speed and less uh, awareness uh, at the beginning, uh, but Moldova uh, took the criticism uh, and uh, politicians in the country took also the reality on the ground. And now we have a serious discussion about the need to enhance our defense and security capabilities with the support of our partners. Moldova joined the Rammstein coalition uh, and see what we can do. Again, uh, a country with limited defense and uh, military capabilities, uh, probably very little can do, but I think still can be done. A lot of things in terms of uh, transportation, infrastructure, and this is exactly what, what Moldova is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Moldova is the main transit country uh, for Ukrainian products on land. One of the main exports from Ukraine go through Moldova. That's a huge, huge pressure, huge, uh, at the same time, uh, challenge for us, which we face together and try to find better ways, including on railways, uh, together with our Ukrainian friends and colleagues. Uh, sanctions. Moldova was... Uh, um, hesitant uh, at the very beginning to politically align to the EU uh, CFSP declarations. That was the case traditionally before. Uh, but that didn't stop Moldova to be active and take real positions in terms of condemning the Russian aggression, uh, taking co-sponsorship of various initiatives in UN, Council of Europe, uh, OEC and other international formats, bilaterally recognizing uh, uh, whatever uh, decisions to be taken in terms of, uh, of uh, against Russia. And de facto, uh, basically, uh, the financial system of Russia is also under sanctions in Moldova because SWIFT cannot be used by our bank banks as well, for example. But that, even that is not enough. Uh, I, as a member of the civil society, I think I also can recognize that uh, countries uh, have, all countries have to provide support to Ukraine because Ukraine indeed is fighting not only for themselves, but they're fighting for us and especially for a country like Moldova. Uh, 
and one of the first contributions uh, that the country is, has done and the society as a whole has done is the fact that we have basically provided shelter to our Ukrainian fellows running from the war. Um, a country that is affected by huge economic issues. We now have one of the highest inflation rates in Europe, 35% of inflation rate. Impacted by the energy crisis, uh, impacted but by, by the uh, uh, massive uh, uh, trade disruptions and so on and so forth. With that, uh, today over 85,000 of Ukrainians are hosted in our houses. Uh, so I think th this is the contribution that we can make as a, as, 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 as a, as a vulnerable neighbor of Ukraine. And I think what it is important today is very much to seek ways how we can learn from our mistakes, both in Kyiv and Kishinev, to build, uh, to build, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, to, to enhance our cooperation, mm -hmm. to see how we can stand together in the future, to see how we can face uh, the challenge of today of Russian hybrid aggression in Moldova as well, and so on and so forth. And I think based on that, I think we can learn much more and we can achieve much more together with Ukraine. And I think this is the, the secret of today that we have between Ukraine and Kishinev, even though we have uh, hiccups uh, in both capitals politically. But I think what is important is that we both have courage to recognize and I think diligence uh, to find things what we can do together and help each other. Because Ukraine is doing a lot today also not to let our country to get freezed. Uh, Russia, Kremlin is blackmailing gas, is reducing every month uh, the supply of gas. It's, we are very much grateful for the support that the EU is providing to us, but also Ukraine that is provided to us, which is storing gas that we're buying today, ju just to make sure that we don't freeze in the winter time. Uh, every month, uh, Gazprom is diminishing the supply against the provisions of the contract with, with our company Moldova Gas. Third, with 30%, I think it was la last month, 30% decrease of supply. Next month, it is uh, announced that it will be another 40% of decrease of supply, and so on and so forth. So, even now, I think uh, uh, we have a lot of things uh, uh, ahead of us in terms of challenges. Uh, I think the winter is coming, and the winter is coming to, for all of us. Uh, but what is important today is to stay strong together and see how we can help each other. Thank you. Um, so I'll pick up two or three questions. So I saw Frederick uh, Lundberg back there, I think one of the first to raise the hands. Please introduce yourself and uh, also say who you're addressing the question to. Yes, Frederick. Thank you. My name is Frederick Leutquist. I'm director for the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies. And we are trying to help the Swedish government now prepare for the EU, Swedish EU presidency next spring. Uh, I think the Eastern Partnership has served its purpose very well, but history now has moved on, and we have big tasks in terms of EU accession and reconstruction of Ukraine ahead. My question is to all, uh, all the panelists, and the first one is, how can Georgia move from being a candidate state to, 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 to achieve a candidate status? What concrete steps and what do you think is a feasible timeline for that? For our Moldovan Ukrainian friends, the question is, what do you think is the timeline for moving from candidate status to the opening of membership negotiations and what concrete intermediary steps can we take from both sides um, in the meanwhile? And there's a colleague in here within the... Yes. Oh, there. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Viestrus Berzinc. I represent Yata Latvia here today. And I actually had a question for Dr. Julian Groza. So you very confidently express that one day Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia will join the EU. Uh, I, myself, as many other Europeans, would very much support this initiative. But we all know that there are also many who oppose further EU uh, expansions. So I wanted to ask you, what would you say to these people who oppose uh, the EU expansion who are opposed to Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova in the EU. Thank you. Please make note of the questions because then we have to answer them mm -hmm. together. And the final question uh, here uh, from the first row, I think you had a question. Yeah. Yes. 
and we'll, so we will stop questions here because we're also running out of time and then give to the speakers time to respond. Uh, hi, I'm Nina Kotelashvili from Georgia, uh, Ilya State University. Today I represent Soviet Pass Research Laboratory and I have one question for Anton. Uh, and uh, the second question for all of the panelists. Uh, first question is about Moldova. Uh, why is still Moldova the part of CIS when uh, Georgia left in 2008 and Moldova still wants to be part of EU and is kind of getting uh, candidate status when Georgia is not getting? And the second question is that Georgia was the leader in this trio uh, and Georgia did really much towards the reforms and has the best uh, results concerning to corruption reforms and many other reforms that Georgia did really great institutional job towards the reforms and still is considered as uh, the best uh, uh, candidate for the getting stat status, but Georgia was left backwards. And why is that? Uh, it's kind of really political decision, not this, this uh, and this decision was not based on this reforms a result. Thank you. So, Thank we get you. That, uh, so I'm going to let's start answering to this in the same order we started. Um, there was not really a question towards Ivana, as I understand the direct one, but I'm sure you want to respond to some of the things which have been said here, uh, as well as the question which was raised uh, from the audience. So please, I'll give the floor to you um, uh, just to have your comments. Thank you. Well, I probably first start with reacting to some of the things, and I think that my last name that uh, has a Georgian part in it allows me to be also very sincere with our, in our conversation with our Georgian friends I, and our Moldovan friends as well. I really uh, agree that back in 2008, um, probably Ukraine was not also among the you know, strongest respondents to the challenge that you have uh, seen in your history from the Russian Federation. And I'm grateful to President Yushchenko, who had actually taken the lead and did everything possible to show our support to, to Georgian people then. Um, unfortunately, yes, there have been politicians here in Ukraine, in the parliament that we are ashamed of at this particular moment. And I think that we should have reacted much stronger, but everybody has to work on lessons learned. We learned our lesson, and therefore, we hope that Georgians and Moldovans do understand that if Ukraine fails to win this war, you do not have any chance for your security, for your independence, and for your statehood. And I'm sorry to say this, but it's not only about our survival. If we all together won't be able to defeat the Russian aggressor, unfortunately, that will have dire consequences first and foremost for your countries, but it will also have dire consequences for the whole geopolitical security order in the whole world. But that's just a, a footnote. With, and I really think that a lot additional efforts could be done and it could be started from the counteraction on information and propaganda. It could be started on, on personal sanctions. It could be, uh, could be uh, also done with regard to limiting number of those Russian deserters that uh, are fleeing from the Russian Federation to save heaven of different countries, as opposed to actually taking care of their responsibility and, and standing up to the regime if they are really against the war as they claim they are, or not just being afraid of their own uh, lives. But with regard to, uh, um, to the question from the, uh, from the gentleman from Sweden, I really think that it's very important right now that the EU institutions, institutions, especially the European Commission, would build the capacity internally to quickly, promptly respond to all the calls from Ukraine in terms of um, giving feedback for the different assessments that we are uh, on, the, on the steps that we are trying to make in order to fulfill those um, seven recommendations or seven conditions that we have received along with the uh, candidate status. And I think that uh, Swedish presidency can um, take the lead in this, in this particular field in order to have the EU being equipped with the instruments to help us to move um, faster on the track of um, um, getting from the candidate status to opening the accession uh, negotiations. In the meantime, 
definitely a lot can be done but um, with regard to access to internal markets, with regard to additional prolongation of the um, um, of the lifting of um, trade quotas and um, and other different things in the economic sphere on the top of all the military financial uh, support that is being rendered and that needs to be not only man maintained but unfortunately needs to be increased as well and there a lot can be done by the presidency. I'll be happy to share some of our thoughts even directly in our com communication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, Igor, uh, to you. Um, there have been some things raised here that I'm sure you want to respond to, including the concrete questions. Thank you. I will try to, re to respond not only yeah, questions, but to the discussion which followed. 2008 aggression against Georgia. Uh, just a simple example how Ukraine reacted to aggression in Georgia of aggression of Russia in Georgia in 2008, right? Uh, Ivan is right. Uh, President Yushchenko was among the first, one of the first leaders who came to Tbilisi, to the central square. He was speaking to your people, to your leadership, supporting, clearly supporting. And that's what practically in the first days of aggression. Then I remember a delegation of Ukrainian government also went uh, to your country. This was a, a response of Ukraine uh, to aggression uh, in Georgia. By the way, uh, when my president was visiting Batumi uh, last year, you remember when we had this trio, we mentioned this meeting already, before heading to the meeting of trio leaders, he went to the contact line in your country and he visited the site. He talked to the soldiers, they showed him how close the aggressors are. I haven't seen any Georgian leader in 2022 in my capital, as well as I haven't seen any Georgian leader in the contact line before the open war. That's about it, reacting. But I am agree, I agree completely that the world overslept the aggression of Russia against Georgia in 2008. Yes, as well as the world overslept the aggression of Russia against Ukraine in 2014, when they first captured Crimea, made this attempt at illegal annexation, then they started in Donbass and the world started to, to be awakened only after these uh, tragic events with uh, the plane, with the May 17. Only after that, when, they, when it hit, the citizens, unfortunately, the citizens of some European Union countries, the European Union started to be awakened, the rest of the world. So this is about reaction uh, to the aggression. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Uh, lessons learned. Hopefully the world has learned the lessons. And that's where we see the unanimous reaction of the international community in 2022. You know, Putin made several miscalculations. He overestimated his, the, the strength of his armed forces. He underestimated the strength of Ukraine and the strength and courage of Ukrainian armed forces and the knowledge and the level of how to use the equipment, the modern sophisticated equipment, which is now uh, so happily given to us by some of our partners in EU and NATO. Uh, you, you probably saw that uh, According to the Pentagon estimations, 12 out of 10 points are given to Ukrainian armed forces for using uh, state-of-the-art Western weaponry. So this is, by the way, about the planes which were not flying. Believe me, Ukrainian magicians, Ukrainian constructors, technicians, soldiers, pilots would make them fly. But, it, but when it was needed, immediately in the first days of war. You just said no to us. You in Moldova said no to us. Go and fight by, 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 our, by your own resources. That's what we did. And so I here completely agree with Ivana. Don't think you will sit behind the screen or behind the TV screen and say, well, we are here, we're sitting quiet. I mean, Ukrainians will fight. Ukrainians will win and we will fight for you. Everything will be good in Transnistria uh, 
until Ukrainians are in Odessa, in the south of Ukraine, and when they're controlling the situation. So this is about reaction. By the way, I haven't heard uh, the answer from uh, esteemed uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs why Georgian delegation was not voting in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, when the resolution was passed after the speech of my president. And among one of the demands he asked from the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe was, please recognize Russia as a terrorist regime. And that's what was inserted into the resolution. And I don't understand why Georgian delegation was not voting. You are not supporting the statement. You don't think that the Russian regime is a terrorist regime. Several countries already in the European Union on the level of their parliaments adopted the similar resolutions. The draft resolution is in the European Parliament already now. And believe me, in November, unanimously, they will support it. So what is wrong with the Georgian, Georgian delegation in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe? Uh, very simple way to, to, to join to the sanctions, uh, to introduce sanctions against Russia, just to join the EU package of sanctions. There are only eight of them, I remind you, and the ninth is being prepared. Answering your question about when Ukraine will move to the next stage. Yes, immediately. With this uh, high Ukrainian speech, uh, speed, which we demonstrated when preparing our documents for the candidacy. Now we are working on the seven recommendations which were provided by the European Commission. We will finalize this work by the end of the year. But we are already working with the member states of the European Union, as well as with the leadership of the EU, with both presidents, President Michel, President von der Leyen, that as soon as Ukraine will fulfill its home task, and Ukraine is fulfilling its home task despite the war and despite difficult economic situation, the parliament is working, the government is working, the president is working and fighting, and Ukrainians are working and fighting. So the timetable uh, would be uh, very uh, quick. And the last point, I cannot agree, sorry, I don't remember the name of the lady, who told that Georgia was leader of the trio. Probably I missed something. But, uh, you know, maybe later on in some memoirs, the diplomats from the European Union would tell you how impatiently President Michel was asking my president to be present in person during this Batumi summit, because without Ukraine, this trio would not fly. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank you. Um, so, brief remarks, because we're, we're ending now. Uh, basically, the time has expired. Uh, Julian and then Temur, you had the questions, uh, basically, what needs to be done for Moldova to go further in terms of the conditions that have to be met, and same question basically to mm -hmm. Temur, as well as to comment to some of the things that you said. But please be brief because we're already cutting to the lunch time. Try to be very brief. Um, next steps: we have to implement nine conditionalities, which has been uh, introduced by the European Commission in the opinion, but sort of conditionalities linked to the country status. Um, in the meantime, Commission is preparing uh, another uh, opinion on the 33 uh, chapters of the questionnaire. But the main milestone is the next uh, European Commission report in uh, autumn next year in the enlargement uh, group, enlargement package. Uh, and uh, basically the objective is that by that time, uh, Moldova to fulfill uh, the uh, nine conditions that would create uh, the, ba the basis uh, and arguments uh, for Moldova being ready to start uh, negotiations on the fundamentals cluster, which, according to the enlargement methodology, it's opened first and closed final, most difficult one, most complex, and I think that is reasonable enough to be started as soon as possible. On, uh, uh, briefly, on the intermediary steps, we have uh, in the association agreements with the EU and in the current formats of the EU, we have a lot of instruments that can be used, which have been started. Uh, most important, I think, is to, fa to, to aim to uh, single market accession, uh, already based on our, uh, uh, the DCFTAs with the EU. What to say uh, about EU expansion? Uh, I just, just to say one anecdote, uh, when I was negotiate, I was part of the negotiations of the association agreement back in 2011, 2014, what I was uh, uh, telling to my counterparts in EU capitals and in Brussels, I was saying, 
give us a clear European perspective. Don't wait for a war to, to start before changing your mind. Uh, since then, Ukraine has been aggressed by Russia twice. Strategic ambiguity didn't help uh, to uh, preserve imperial ambitions of Russia. So I think this is the lesson that I think we all have learned. Uh, we understand that uh, we are a European country in terms of language, culture, uh, and uh, we belong to Europe uh, and we should be part of Europe. Uh, we have a process in which we are engaged now. It's the accession negotiations, uh, which has to be start, started. Uh, it will be a long process, there will be no shortcuts, uh, but that process will help us to transform and get ready for the moment when we will be part of the European Union. And in the meantime, we will be stronger, more democratic, more developed country which and more secure uh, uh, country in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Demo, Thank you. Final words, please. Yes, uh, very shortly as well I will react on. So first of all, uh, reaction on the comments that uh, it wasn't my intention to uh, say any concrete country or to blame any con con concrete country on something. So I, I brought some facts uh, which were not responded properly from international community. And because of this, we got uh, quite a deteriorated situation now in our continent, in our region. And it was the reason why I have mentioned it, first of all. The secondly, uh, what we need now and what's most important thing is that we feel that there is, a, again, if we are not united, if we are not standing together, it's again, it's again the, uh, how to say it, uh, water on the, on, on the on not of, of, of some countries which really are seeking just to divide us and somehow to see that division can be uh, used for them uh, to, to, to implement their aggressive policy. I think that unity was the most important thing is nowadays, and we are following this process and we will continue uh, to be uh, in, in line of this. The question which was about the timelines and implementation of the uh, recommendations which we got from the Commission. So we got the 12 recommendations from the Commission and uh, immediately uh, we have reacted on. So we created nine uh, working groups and uh, within these working groups uh, the members of the Parliament, government, non-governmental organizations, experts are working together and uh, the task is just to implement this uh, 12 recommendation till the end of this year. So of course we are not expecting that the official assessment of these recommendations will be till the end of this year, but still as we have pledged to do this till the end of this year, we are going to implement it. And of course we are expecting that from the next year official assessment process will be started and at the end of the year, uh, somehow we will get already our deserved candidacy status uh, uh, to, uh, we, uh, with the European Union. And of course, uh, when we are talking about the implementation of uh, association agreement and DCFTA, and it was mentioned that Georgia was the leader bit, uh, among the associated countries, so it was not our conclusion. It was a conclusion of the Brussels-based uh, non-governmental institutions uh, which uh, were assessing the process of implementation of the association agreement at the CFTA. And it still continues. So at this moment, it's no, not our, uh, again, assessment. We have implemented about 50% uh, of our association agreement and uh, around 60-65% of the DCFTA, which is really good uh, process and we are devoted again to continue, notwithstanding of the recommendations and obligations which we have taken by this, but as well as uh, obligations which we have taken by the new association agenda with the European Union, we are going to implement the association agreement and we are going to implement it up to maybe 90% because it will give us more prospect to be uh, uh, to become a full-fledged uh, member of the European Union. And, of course, it doesn't envisage the membership, but the reforms which we are doing is going to be for, for this uh, target and for, for this Thank you. Thing. Thank you, Tamur. I wish we had another hour to talk about the concrete conditionalities, whether it's the deoligarchization or the freedom of media or the corruption or the other things. Unfortunately, we don't. We have to end here. Thank you, everybody, for the active participation, for interesting comments. Uh, and uh, I think we have to break for lunch now. Once again, thank you thank for you. our Ukrainian friends.